Now I'd like to welcome Kevin Mahaffey, the co-founder and the Chief Technology Officer of Lookout. It wasn't too long ago before you were in the press because you did a famous stunt. You showed that celebrities' uh, phones were not that, <laughs> that secure at the Oscars. So tell us about it. Yeah. Thanks. Pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I am going to tell a, a story about how uh, Lookout got started. And it, it, it started with a set of problems that we, we originally discovered but uh, have, have since evolved over time. And the, the story of Lookout begins in around 2004. Um, I'm sure many of you might have had this phone. Uh, this particular model is the Nokia 6310i. Um, it was r unremarkable in a number of uh, factors. It was, had a black and white screen. It had Snake, awesome game. And what was really interesting to us was it had Bluetooth. This is one of the first phones that I had my hands on that was able to talk to my computer. Um, typically, people were only able to uh, make phone calls and text messages through their phones. But in this one, we were able to actually send fun things to it through a computer. And so like, like uh, as, a, as security researchers, uh, what we did was we, we tried to break it. This is kind of what got me in trouble all throughout my high school years. <laughs> and uh, we broke it. We disclosed the vulnerabilities to uh, phone manufacturers. Uh, in this phone in particular, uh, the vulnerabilities allowed us to take full control over the device, uh, send text messages, uh, look at its phone calls, actually make phone calls, turn it into a bug. And when we disclosed it to Nokia, uh, we were greeted with a, a few issues. Uh, number one was it's really expensive to patch phones. What you had to do at that time, you had to plug in your phone at a carrier store, and most of your data would oftentimes get erased. It would take half an hour to issue a patch. That's not really usable. And one of the other issues was that nobody actually saw phones as computing devices. This was a thing you made phone calls with. You know, the, the, the response we were greeted with was, why would anyone want to hack a phone? Um, it doesn't leave too many questions as to why Nokia is in their market position as they are today, if that was their, their mentality. But that was, the, that was the prevailing wisdom in 2004. Uh, and so we were also greeted with the, the final straw, which was the range of Bluetooth is only 10 to 100 meters. And all of these things stacked together said nobody was going to take action to protect their users from security vulnerabilities. And for us, as security researchers, we view it, you know, perhaps uncontroversially nowadays, as a moral and ethical responsibility to protect your users from threats. Um, and so we built this. Uh, this is the Blue Sniper. Uh, this is a long-range Bluetooth gun with an embedded Linux, Linux computer. Uh, we had a little bit of a flair for the dramatic. Uh, and uh, what it does is we were actually able to hack a Nokia phone from over 1.12 miles away. Uh, and we had set the world record, this is around 2004 when we built this, uh, in, in hacking a mobile phone. And what we thought we were doing was doing a demonstration to the technology community to help people understand that uh, this is how Bluetooth works. The range is not only 10 meters to 100 meters. Look at what you can do with these sorts of things. And, and for us, this was, this was mainly a, a part of the, the bargain in security disclosure. If you disclose vulnerabilities responsibly and the vendor takes the appropriate urgency to fix the vulnerabilities, you don't do anything. You'd get credit for finding the bug and you go on your very way. Um, many companies will actually pay bounties to fix vulnerabilities nowadays, but the other part of that bargain that you see less and less in traditional software companies, but oftentimes more and more in industries that are not historically software industries, but that are becoming software industries, is that they, they, they bring in the lawyers or they just ignore security researchers. And that bargain says you get to disclose publicly, oftentimes with a very cool talk at DEF CON, uh, to, to be able to demonstrate the vulnerabilities. And so uh, we, we built this. We got, we got some press around it. Uh, we lived in Los Angeles at the time. And the Academy Awards were in town. So we said, OK, you know, what do we do? Uh, well, we went out there with actually, it wasn't, we didn't go out with that gear. We went out with a slightly more uh, subtle gear. Uh, uh, I, I have not been shot, so this is good. Um, and we, we didn't actually hack any phones at the red carpet, but we did a, an analysis. We did a passive scan of all of the devices on the red carpet. And we found a whole bunch of celebrities' phones that could very easily have been hacked. And this got picked up in the Wall Street Journal, and the New York Times, and a number of other publications. And this was the first realization that we had that we were not dealing with a very academic, esoteric problem that me and 10 other electrical engineers cared about for RF propagation of Bluetooth. This was actually a mainstream issue that anyone who had a phone, which even in 2004 was probably your most personal piece of computing technology, should care about. 
And that, that's what led us to, to start fixing the problem that, that we're fixing today, which is how do we secure phones? So we spent the next few years um, trying to actually work with manufacturers to, to secure their phones before they ship. I mean, this is the kind of the rational way to fix the problem. Uh, if you look at the costs of fixing software vulnerabilities, they're just substantially lower, orders of magnitude lower when you fix them before devices are in the field as opposed to after. Um, unfortunately, there was not a lot of market pressure. Um, you know, there was no uh, active choice that either consumers or enterprises were making to choose a more secure phone or a less secure phone. Basically, consumers bought whatever was pretty, and enterprises bought Blackberries. So that, that's just how the world worked. Um, and then in 2007, after a few years of banging our heads against the wall, we said, OK, you know, we really, really want to secure mobile devices, but perhaps how we've been going about it was not working. Um, what you see on the right is the uh, HTC Tilt. Um, running Windows Mobile. Um, Windows 2007 was also the year the iPhone came out. We decided to start building software on mobile devices to protect them from threats. But you know, you can see where this is going. You say, Kevin, are you just trying to reinvent the, ant com the commercial antivirus industry on mobile? Um, many people have seen screens like this when they start up their computer. Uh, I'd say there's, there's not a lot of consumer love for the uh, consumer antivirus industry. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, and, and, and I say that a little bit in jest because um, it, it is a very valuable tool, and, it, and there's a reason it was built the way it was. Um, but now we're in a world where you know, the majority of margin on many desktop PC makers is based on the bloatware that they put on their, their computer, and, and users are just barraged, and they, they, they don't trust it anymore. Um, at the same time, there's an economic issue. Um, when a malware writer creates malware, particularly in, an, like in say, an enterprise context, uh, an IT department will uh, say, see something funny going on in one of their PCs. They might send these samples to an antivirus lab. Uh, antivirus labs are, are staffed with extremely brilliant researchers, Symantec, McAfee, Kaspersky. They have top, top, top researchers. They've been working on this problem for 20 years. And they're very good, once they have a piece of malware, understanding it, dissecting it, and getting to the root of the problem. So what happens is they create a signature, uh, or either uh, on the code or some heuristics about the behavior of the application, and they push it back to the IT department. Computer's fixed. The problem is the bad guys know as soon as this signature is pushed, and all they do is modify a few lines of code, and they have new malware. And so this is, this is a circle. It repeats itself over and over and over. You might hear words like variants or samples, and that, that's what's happening here. And at the end of the day, the economic breakdown of this is there's a 10 to 1 asymmetry. The good guys need to put in 10 units of effort to find the threat, produce a signature, push out definitions back. But the bad guys only need to put in one unit of effort to change a few lines of code in their malware to get around it. And this is, this is a problem, right? The, you know, it, it might work great when you have millions of computers affected by one piece of malware, but when we're talking about targeted attacks that occur on one or two computers in the world, you're not going to be able to spend that 10 to 1 effort. It's, it's, it, you're, you're going to lose nine days out of 10. And, and now we're in a world where, where that's starting to become a problem. Um, and so on mobile, where, where what was, uh, I think, modestly inadequate, inadequate at PC scale is now colossally inadequate at mobile scale. You have everyone from the president using mobile devices to soldiers in the fields to uh, hundreds of thousands of users in Kenya. We don't have a car, we don't have a computer, but they can get a $60 unsubsidized Android phone that has Twitter, right? So the next two billion people to use the internet might do so through a mobile phone. And if we're, if we're talking about systematic asymmetries from an economic standpoint, th that, that doesn't scale well. You have, in first world countries, you might actually be able to pay huge inordinate amounts of money to throw resources at the problem to secure, secure your computers. But when you start adding orders of magnitude of new internet connected devices, that those numbers just, it just doesn't work. Plus, mobile is growing so quickly that we couldn't possibly train an analyst team on mobile technologies fast enough if we tried. Um, this is the scariest graph your IT department will ever see. Uh, what it says is that uh, all of the last two and a half decades of uh, security investment is now obsolete in addressing a minority of computing devices on the planet. Uh, <laughs> it's not good at all. And so now the question is, what do we do? Um, this was the question we were, we were posed with. And you know, I, I'm not one to say, oh, crap, security's over, computing's over, just, just unplug everything, because that, that's, that's not cool. Um, and so for us, we say, how do we, how do we reinvent security? How do we re reset security for this next generation of computing? And for us, the answer is that we turn security into a data problem. Um, and let me explain how, how that actually works. Um, so one of the most common ways malware, malware works is that you actually have a legitimate application that's injected with malware and republished. 
so that as a user, you can't tell the difference between a good app and a bad app. Um, I'll show you an example. Uh, this is one example of a piece of malware that operates in this way. And uh, when an analyst might reverse engineer it, um, they might see something like this. Uh, and the, the diagram you're seeing is each node is a line of, co or is a, is a class, this is a Java, and each line between the nodes is interaction between the codes. So what you see uh, in the upper right, that's the injected malware. Notice it doesn't interact with the rest of the code. So if this were a traditional anti-malware model, you would have an analyst who would look at those, those, those four nodes right there, find some unique characteristics, and write a signature against it, either against the code itself or some sort of behavior. Uh, but the problem is, OK, you wrote a signature against that. We still have our 10 to 1 asymmetry problem. Uh, and, and the approach we, we've taken to this problem is to say, hey, instead of just looking at one app, let's put everything in context. Uh, and the, the, the framing I have for this, this is actually a lot of the same way Google revolutionized search. You know, pre-Google, uh, Boolean keyword-based searching was, was the thing. Um, you know, the, the, the site that had mesothelioma printed 10 times in its title and in big, bold text was the thing that came up when you searched mesothelioma. But Google saw that it was very easily gamed, and this is the magic of the PageRank algorithm. The PageRank algorithm said, take a giant data set of every page on the internet, you look how they're related, and those relations actually define what your, your relevance is. Um, that's the same way we look at apps uh, in the world. Um, we draw correlations between code, between behaviors, and, and a number of other things, so that when, when we do find something bad, uh, the bad guys can't hide. Um, and and I, I look at this in the same way of, you know, let's imagine you robbed a bank. What would, you, what would you need to do to hide from the FBI? You would probably have to change your email accounts. Uh, you know all of the, uh, the web services you, you don't need to use anymore if you wanted to hide from the government. Uh, you would have to change your, your, your identity cards. You'd probably have to change your phone numbers. And you might even have to get facially reconstructive surgery. Right? That's a huge amount of things you need to do. So it's actually a lot of people don't rob banks for that reason. Um, but the problem is, is in, in the antivirus world, you might only have to change your identity card. Just get around the signature and you're good to go. But by stacking lots of different correlations together with a, a huge data set, we, we don't make it impossible. All of the things we look for are, are possible to get around, but when you have enough of them, you stack them together, it actually gets extremely expensive to get around them. And so this is, this is an economic game to, to get around that bad guys. Um, but mobile devices are, are not the only things that we have to worry about. Um, we, we, we started with the problem of how do we secure mobile phones. Now there are plenty of connected devices. And I, I actually did an experiment uh, a couple months ago where I, as I went through my, my daily life and I wanted to ask how many connected devices in the world uh, did, I, did I touch? You know, you hear about the Internet of Things, the Internet of Everything. What does that actually mean? I, I'm a security guy, so I'm naturally skeptical. Um, so I said, okay, let me just start with things that I know have IP addresses. I started with our conference bridge. Uh, turns out, runs a full-on operating system, has an IP address, and has open ports. Printer, many of you are familiar with that. Uh, our projector, uh, this actually ran Windows CE. Uh, <laughs> e. uh, our coffee machine has an SSH daemon running on it. My router. My Wii runs a computer. And my Apple TV. My receiver. My Blu-ray player. And the airline seatback entertainment system. Uh, many of you who are familiar with security issues know that PDFs are one of the main vectors that are, are used by state-sponsored attacks. And I was particularly interested to see my airplane had a PDF reader on it. It's not good. Um, so now the question, you might say, okay, that's cute. You know, who, who, who cares if we, we hack, hack my Wii or my, you know, my conference bridge? Yeah, you might be able to get a little bit of information, but is that really a big deal? Um, well, now we start to, to ask what, what happens, you know, how do we patch these things? Um, and there is no Windows update for, for things. Um, it is actually a big problem. I mean, we're faced with the same problem we started with in 2004, which was how do you fix security issues? A, a lot of these, these Internet of Things industry, they're not historically software industries. Um, and historical software industries have faced the pain. Many of you remember Microsoft. You know, they were the laughing stock of the security world for the longest time. But then they got their act together. They were burned so badly in the press, they, they realized that if they didn't, their business would be nil. Um, and they got their act together. But I, I, my fear is that we have a whole generation of companies who, who don't have that institutional knowledge that, yep, they're, they're starting and trying to ship in consumer electronics timeframes and, and, and not 
uh, taking the diligence to security. Uh, but now what happens if we start to have things that are not just consumer electronics? Uh, critical safety systems are starting to get connected. Um, this is a good thing. Um, it makes response better, makes them easier to maintain um, cars. Um, don't get me started. Uh, and then thermostats. Um, you know, what happens when you have a worm on a million computers? Well, you might be able to take down a Costa Rican gambling site. What happens when you infect a million thermostats? Well, you know, a ask your nearest electrical grid operator if a million people turn on their air conditioning all simultaneously within three seconds of each other. Uh, that's not good for the grid. Uh, and that's a, a, a very, very serious set of problems. But ultimately, I, I, I'm bullish. Uh, I think there's, there's two worlds, two ways this can all go. In one way, everything's screwed. We're all, we're all going to get hacked in, in cyber war, cyber war, cyber war. Uh, in another world, we can actually secure these things. And we can take advantage of connected devices. They help people get access to information, not only in this country, but around the world, potentially people who've never had access to computers before. We get innovation in payments. We get access to a whole new set of technologies that makes our life better. And my view is that security, security is the platform by which that happens. Uh, not the platform in the same way Box is a platform for enabling enterprise applications, but the platform insofar as if security ain't there, you won't do it. Um, and so this is, this is our, our, our challenge to ourselves is how, how do we create a world that, um, you know, as, as it does get more connected, more people, things, and, and yeah, and everything around us gets connected, how, how do we make it more secure as opposed to less secure? And, and I think that thinking about these problems at scale and not just in the same way that they have been dealt with in the past is the, the only way we'll get there because if we, if we apply the, the solutions that you know, modestly worked in the past to the, the next generation of computing devices, uh, we're, we're gonna have some problems. And ultimately, I, I, I'm optimistic and you know, we certainly know the problem we have ahead of us. You know, what started with a, a Nokia 6310i uh, and how do we secure very, very minute protocol issues in Bluetooth is now for us a question of how do we secure the next gen two generations of computing. And, and I think the, the challenge that many companies will face in the security world is how do you deal with scale? Um, because we're no longer dealing with a billion computers we're dealing with tens of billions of computers. And there's no operator there to find something that's acting funny to tell their IT department to have an antivirus lab look at it uh, because there's no operator. And I think this is going to be the, the, the key challenge we face certainly in the future. But ultimately, I'm optimistic. Well, I'm not. Now, now I'm scared. Um, um, so if there is, in fact, a internet of things with billions of devices. Uh, there's no one operator looking to secure it, and we're wide open. Why are there not more viruses already? Have hackers simply not turned their attention? I think right now, PCs are still too easy. Huh. Um, ultimately, it's, it's an economic game. Um, hmm. PC, I mean, you look around and, and companies, governments, everyone are, are getting attacked. and. And I'd like to think we've actually done a pretty good job on mobile. Um, mm -hmm. I can point to a number of incidences where we've worked with network operators in the US and abroad and actually found threats. And there's some really interesting stories where uh, there's a threat and we worked with an operator to find it. We, we blocked it on our systems. Mm -hmm. But they, they engaged in the, the behavior I talked about where they mutated their code. This was about two years ago before we had all these correlations. And we lost track of them. Mm -hmm. But the network operator we worked with, the carrier, actually saw the network traffic still there. And they had, had track of them. And so we, we were able to stop that. And then so the bad guys assumed they were being caught on the network, so they changed their network behavior, but not their code. Yeah. And then we, we caught the next iteration of that. And this went back and forth probably about eight times where they would change one of their code or their network behavior, but never both, because they never assumed that you would actually have data sets that were meshed up. And eventually they just stopped. And that was one of the early victories that we had to say, hey, treating this as a data problem can actually actually solve the problem. Be a big insight. Do we have any questions for Kevin? Um, uh, I saw a hand go up somewhere, though I'm kind of blind on the lights. Well, wh while you think, let me, let me ask a question. Um, I often used to think that it, we would need some sort of security Pearl Harbor, some massive breach. Before, I, know that, I know this is a cliche that the security community hates. 
um, if only because there have been such breaches and haven't, they haven't really changed consumer behavior. And they haven't really created the shift in methodology we want with software developers as well. What do you think it will take to get people to take this seriously, or is it a never-ending fight? Well, I do think that security is, is, is inherent in all technology, that yeah. it's not something that you solve and it goes away. Though my hope is that we've all learned our lesson, uh, and I think that's what we're seeing, particularly with carriers and network operators, that they're taking a very activist role that you, you, you actually don't see in the ISP space, where mm -hmm. uh, let's say you get malware on your phone, you're going to blame your carrier, and you might switch, and they know that. Mm -hmm. And so they're doing everything possible to make sure that that doesn't happen. Are there, in terms of state intrusions, particularly mm -hmm. from you know, countries like China, uh, is there anything that companies can or should do, or are they essentially uh, completely vulnerable to such attacks? So for, for a motivated attacker, um, the, the, the general... Uh, I love that euphemism, motivate, <laughs> for a motivated attacker. Yeah. Uh, so I mean, there, there, we, we separate attackers into two, two sides. Yeah. One is the economically motivated attackers, and then the price inelastic attackers. Yeah. Namely, they will throw as much resource as it takes to go get you. Yeah. Uh, the rule of thumb is there's really nothing you can do to stop an, a sufficiently motivated attacker. However, uh, a, a lot of where security is moving is, is not stopping the breach, yeah. but stopping or detecting the breach very, very quickly after it started before too, too much has happened. So detect it early, and for price-sensitive attackers, make it simply so unrewarding exactly right. that it's not in their interest. Make it too expensive. And for everyone else, assume for the price inelastic attacker, simply assume you're open anyway. Assume you're open anyway, but mm -hmm. uh, always watch out. And this is, I think, what differentiates consumers from mm -hmm. enterprises, whereas end users usually are not going to have inelastic attackers attacking them. Whereas governments, businesses, anyone who has IP of, of use, uh, they tend to have the, the, the motivated adversary. Hmm. Kevin, thank you very much. Thank I you. enjoyed Appreciate that. It.